Okay, so why don't we get started? So good evening, folks, and welcome back for session two. Uh, quite an interesting book to be discussed uh, discuss tonight. Um, and I'm going to dispense with the big intro because we all heard it last week. I just want to mention to you to remind you that with our schedule, we are skipping next week. And so we'll be picking up again on May 3rd and then on May 10th. And just as a reminder, think ahead a little bit about whether you'd like to come to the library in person on May 10. And I'll be sending out an email uh, about a week before that to see if there's enough interest to uh, have Mark in the Brubeck room, also on Zoom with a camera on him. Um, but for the folks that would like to come in person, uh, we'd like to offer you also some wine and cheese and some soft drinks also in a little conversation. So think about that in advance. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mark. Thanks. <clears throat> and I'll let you all in on a little secret. Michael plans for that last in-person meeting to be a costume party. Come as any one of the characters in Wise Blood. Think about it. Um, Great idea. So good evening, everybody. Um, I can't tell you how many times in the last few months since I started this series uh, back uh, in uh, the spring of 2022, people have emailed me to say, can't we do a book that has a guy in a gorilla suit or a preacher who falsely blinds himself or a shrunken body kept in a museum case or a preacher who insists that he's not a preacher who actually successfully blinds himself and issues about dead children and dysfunctional families. Well, your prayers, so to speak, have been answered uh, tonight. We're doing Wise Blood, 1952, by Flannery O'Connor. Flannery O'Connor is mainly known uh, for the many short stories that she wrote. She wrote two novels, of which this is the first, and generally considered the better one. Uh, I do think that if you did not like this story, and if you continue not to like it after tonight's presentation, you might give her short stories a try because I think that they are actually more successful because they're more concentrated, they're more focused. Uh, but it's my hope to try to put into several different contexts how you might think of what this book is about. Uh, Flannery O'Connor, who was a devout Catholic, and who made her Catholicism part of her public relations. You see that on the uh, 10th anniversary of this book, she published a note in which she says that it's a comic novel, and it is. It is a novel filled with Black comedy. We'll talk about that. But she means it absolutely seriously that this is a man who tries to deny and avoid Jesus and finds that he cannot do it, and so his integrity, from her point of view, is in what he cannot do. Uh, that may be her aim, and uh, I recognize and respect people who have philosophical or religious agenda, and certainly Flannery O'Connor is one of those people. But her power is in her art, and her art is much more complicated than the idea of Jesus is a ragged man who moves from tree to tree in the back of um, Hazel Moat's mind, and that as much as he tries to get away from Jesus, he cannot. That is not a new idea. Um, in uh, 1951, Graham Greene published a very good novel called The End of the Affair, in which the narrator of that novel uh, tries to avoid uh, a recognition that God exists, despite some evidence in his own personal life. And he winds up being in a perpetual argument with a God that she, he doesn't believe in, which from many religious people's point of view is enough. Uh, you can't argue with a God you don't think exists. And then more recently, the novel by an American, John Irving's A Prayer for Owen Meany, also narrated by a man who is a disbeliever. And he has the convenient name of John, like one of the evangelists. And he winds up having an argument with God uh, in whom he does not believe. So I don't think the distinctive thing that makes the book unique or particularly distinctive is that Hazel Moats is a man who is so God intoxicated. That's a phrase that was used by the Victorian writer Thomas Carlyle, that he cannot get out of his own way and his non-belief becomes his religion. Um, 
church without Christ is uh, punning in more than one way. What's distinctive about the book is the black comedy and some of what I mentioned in uh, the beginning about how much wackiness can you have in a single book? And uh, wackiness alone, uh, that's a sophisticated literary term. You could look it up. Wackiness alone won't carry the book. So I'm going to try to give you context frames that you can put around it. But I will say we've come a long way from Nebraska uh, and my Antonia. We're not in Nebraska anymore. And the absolute seriousness of that book, there's not much humor in my Antonia. There's certainly not black comedy. Uh, the destruction, the fear, the sad pioneer woman story, a uh, child out of wedlock, the um, tragedy with the wolves, uh, they're all deadly serious. It's not a depressing book, uh, but it's certainly not comic. The comedy of this book is part of its meaning because think of when this book was published. It was published in 1952. That was the time that the middle class American culture, the GI Bill, uh, the baby boomers, um, studies in sociology on called white collar, the American middle class, uh, came out in 1951. The Lonely Crowd was published in 1950, a respected sociological study about people in Eisenhower, America, finding their um, community in the group. <clears throat> but it turns out it's a group that erases individuality. So you're lonely in a crowd. Uh, the Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, was a work of fiction, 1955, later made into a movie with Gregory Peck. <clears throat> but it makes the same point about the idea of conservatism, <clears throat> excuse me, and complacency. 1956, The Organization Man was a work of sociology that surveyed many, many CEOs of large companies who turned out to believe that working for the organization working for the good of the organization was a far better um, key to success than working for your own advancement. And so the democratic ideal of rugged individualism, that each person should be himself, Walt Whitman in 1850 published a poem called Song of Myself, by which he meant each of us should sing ourselves. Uh, that seemed to be lost. So one of the things this book wants to do is it wants to shake the reader out of any se sense of middle-class complacency. One of the things that um, uh, Flannery O'Connor despised was what she called middle-brow culture. Um, she herself was um, educated with a bachelor's and then a master of fine arts. She was admitted to the very prestigious um, Iowa Writers Workshop, um, and she never taught. Um, she preferred to do criticism and essays and reviews and work on her stories. She was also afflicted uh, from a young age with lupus, which was a disease uh, that killed her father uh, when he was in his 40s, and she was to die at the age of 39. And that not only limited her ability to do a lot or to travel much, although she was heroic in overcoming it, but also uh, gave her a sense of uh, how the body can betray you. So she wrote when she talked about what she hoped to do with her fiction uh, in a, uh, and there are many collections of her essays um, and there's a um, collection by uh, her biographer of her letters, I recommend them to you. She wrote that the dark and divisive romance novel, that is the novel that is imaginative, not the love story novel, but a, a, um, a creative, idiosyncratic, inventive novel, has combined with the comic grotesque. And this novel, again, meant as a comedy with a serious end, is filled with grotesques. Uh, not just uh, the shriveled man, but people who were warped by either their insistence that they worship the absence of a god like Hazel Motes or their con artists who um, 
are not successful, particularly um, as a con artist. Uh, there's more than one in, in the novel. Uh, the constant references to people with deformed or swollen or um, distorted bodies, uh, very common here. You may remember uh, that when we did Winesburg, Ohio, that was our second meeting last spring. That begins with an introduction called The Book of the Grotesques, where Sherwood Anderson says that um, people started to focus on one thing. And by focusing on one thing, they arrested their development as full human beings. And they became obsessed by this one thing that turned them into a grotesque. Grotesque doesn't necessarily mean ugly, although it can and often does in this book. It means distorted. It means twisted, not mentally, but physically malformed. Uh, and there are a number of examples here of uh, twisted or deformed bodies. Um, she says that she embraced the dark and divisive romance novel combined with the comic grotesque to preserve our Southern literature for at least a little while from middle brow subject matter. She got the idea that the threat to Southern culture in the 1950s was the homogenization of America. The highway system under the Eisenhower administration threatened to do, in her view and views of others, what the railway system did 100 years before in England, which is homogenized culture. Uh, when the railways came into the countryside in England, um, the little village of uh, Bellicosa uh, could no longer have its own patron saint, um, St. Michael, and close on his feast day if they wanted to be part of the national grid. So if you wanted a depot uh, on the main line in the town of uh, Bellicosa, you had to give up your local traditions and not have that holiday. In the same way, the highway system made it possible for people who would never think of traveling from Nebraska to Tennessee or Tennessee to Maine to be able to do it. And the commercialization of America, uh, the proliferation of um, expendable money for the rising middle class, one of the ways you show that you're uh, rising is you buy stuff. When um, Hazel says a man with a good car doesn't have to be redeemed, uh, Flannery O'Connor is making a very serious point. Uh, maybe the religion of America, which had grown in its participation in Catholic and Protestant church going in the 1950s, a great boom in church attendance. But a lot of the religion had to do with possessing things. And that commercialization is partly parodied in this book, which I hope to show you. Part of the seriousness of what this book has to say Part of what the book is about beyond the religion that Flannery O'Connor couldn't help but promote. Uh, I myself think that if the book is as good as it is, she shouldn't have to say on its 10th anniversary, it's a comic book about something dreadfully serious, which is that belief in Jesus Christ is a life and death matter. Um, I think you can appreciate the book as a powerful work of art without worrying about whether you personally or anyone in the book believes in Jesus Christ. You cannot ignore the religious dimension. It's everywhere in the book. But the point that's being made more seriously is a criticism of America at the same time that she's trying to keep a Southern tradition that will account for a failed blinding, a true blinding, distorted bodies, dismembered bodies, children killed, a woman, Sabbath Lily's mother who gives birth to her, rolls over and dies, uh, a woman who is on display in a carnival, who is either naked or very scantily clothed, who young Hazel, Hayes he's called, uh, sees as a transgressive act. He's not supposed to look. The guy lets him in, takes a few pennies he has, and she's in a case, a box that's lined with black cloth. That is a kind of coffin. And he looks in and he first thinks that this very pale body 
is a skinned animal. And then he sees it's a fat woman with a mole on her uh, her lip. Uh, if she's naked, and presumably that's what the excitement is, to see a unclothed or poor, very scantily clothed woman, if she's um, meant to be sexual, it doesn't register with Hazel, who is more struck by what you might call her grotesquerie. She's fat. She's naked. She's very, very white. <clears throat> And she has a mole that he notices when you think he'd be noticing other body parts. Uh, when he goes to the toilet, uh, when he's at the train station and he sees the ad for Leora Watts, um, we're told that he's in a box sitting in that stall. He's in a box. And there are references to other coffins um, in the novel. And the shriveled man is in a glass case, which is kind of like a coffin. Uh, death is a very important part of Southern culture. And if we turn then from this idea of uh, wanting to keep Southern culture free of the homogenization of America, <clears throat> and we think what's being kept of Southern culture, it's that reference she makes to dark and divisive romance novel and the comic grotesque. The phrase for that that's come into literary criticism is the Southern Gothic. Uh, and that's a, that's a term that is sometimes overused or sometimes used as a kind of excuse, but it's a real trend. And I want to talk about it before uh, we turn to opening up questions when Michael returns uh, so that he can um, MC that. So um, European Gothic, uh, stories about supernaturalism and werewolves and vampires and things that go bump in the night. That came up at the end of the 18th century when people started to tire of the Enlightenment's insistence that rationalization, the reason, was the way to understanding. And some of those writers, almost always prose writers, felt that the emphasis on the rational, Think about the French Revolution. Think about uh, the American Revolution. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Thomas Paine wrote about common sense. All you have to do is think about the world and God's reason in you will make sense of it. Well, a number of writers and intellectuals in Europe and in America, but especially in Europe, said that's only part of the equation. And a lot of human life is about uncommon sense, about the irrational, dreams and phobias and uh, imagination and trauma, uh, which originates in the German word for dream. And some of those writers responded by writing novels about dead children buried in the basements of convents and monasteries, uh, working on the idea that there's something uh, gothic about the Catholic Church, um, which is uh, gothically, has Gothic architecture, and Goth comes from the tribes during the Holy Roman Empire who didn't accept the culture of Rome, and they were the savages, the barbarians, and that word barbarian comes from the fact that they didn't speak Latin, so they mumbled, they talked ba 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 like a baby, they babbled, and that word babble. A bar uh, baby became barbarian. They were people who didn't speak Latin. They were uncivilized and savage. And in order to tap centuries later, the European desire to see another side of life besides the reason of the philosophers who helped uh, found the French Revolution, the founding fathers who relied on reason and deism to create a kind of American philosophy, uh, the kind of reason that made uh, Isaac Newton one of the preeminent prominent uh, natural philosophers. We would call him a scientist uh, in that age. And you have a whole wave of romanticism, um, Kubla Khan, uh, um, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, which has a supernatural element, um, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, Percy Bysshe Shelley's poems, Byron, Coleridge, Wordsworth, 
this whole investigation, celebration, and enactment of the unnatural, the Gothic writers looked at the darker side of things in the same way as in America when Thoreau and Emerson, writing at the middle of the 19th century, were celebrating the transcendental as a positive thing, as a beneficial thing. You had writers like Melville, Hawthorne, and Poe working on the darker side of the transcendental, also interested in the supernatural, but not as something instructive and morally supporting, but something unnerving. Uh, so Carlyle, the Scottish writer that I mentioned earlier, who coined the phrase, God intoxicated man, not about Hazel Motes, he was writing 100 years before, but of people who cannot get God out of their mind even if they say they don't believe in him. He coined a new word in English, and that word was descendental. Carlyle believed that if you wanted to be, if you wanted to think that there was something transcendental in the universe, there was something beyond human understanding by reason that was higher and better. And certainly Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, other writers in mid-century, mid-19th century America believe that. He said, you have to look at the other end of the spectrum and you have to believe in the descendental. That is, that there's something demonic and chaotic, something supernaturally negative. He didn't use the term devil, but he used the notion of decay, of something rotting. If transcendental makes us aspire beyond what is usual human ability, isn't there something that constantly retards us and pulls us back? And he wrote in one of his journals, and I recommend Emerson's journals to you if they're still in print or selection from them. He talked about a kind of bipolarity of sometimes feeling transcendental, not his word, Carlisle's word, my word now, and descendental. And he said, there are days when I am a god in nature, and there are days when I am a weed by the wall. Now you can say that's bipolar disorder, and maybe there's some truth to that. But in terms of his creativity, uh, in terms of his output, not in poetry, but in prose, Emerson was a great enactor of the fact that we see things in ourselves that pull us beyond human limits upward and things that pull us back down, uh, descendental. So one of the things about the European Gothic is it's exploring the supernatural for the purposes of reminding people that reason is not enough. It means to be scary. It means to be suspenseful. It means to be a well-crafted novel. The, Europe the Southern Gothic does not want to be scary or suspenseful. It wants to be grotesque. It wants to be distasteful. It wants to be creepy, not in the sense of things that go bump in the night, but things like this novel, uh, whatever literary term you want to apply to this novel, creepy is as good as any other. And she's quite intentional in saying, this is something that is a brand, a hallmark of Southern culture and literature. Why? Because post-Civil War, you have the legacy of racism, of slavery, of guilt on the part of some people for the legacy of slavery and racism. For some people, trauma of the Civil War or Reconstruction, the trauma of being defeated by the North and living with a kind of occupation of the North, an unspoken or stifled desire for revenge, sometimes a quite forceful desire for revenge, a fear of outsiders like the carpetbaggers, and others who were taking over their country, their state, the South, a sense of isolation from other states, being marginalized, and very often the image of being trapped, like being in a stall in a toilet or being in a coffin. Uh, these are some of the burdens that the South was carrying, and certain writers are part of a tradition that examine that, even if they're not celebrating it. Now, I want to say in this particular novel, there's a kind of celebration by O'Connor, 
because she actually believed there's more to life than life. She is absolutely a devout Catholic writer. Uh, we have to acknowledge that. I don't think we need to use it as the key to understanding the novel. I'm trying to suggest a couple of more ways that you can put it into context. But other writers were not trying to celebrate it, but account for it or enact it. And some of the great Southern Gothic writers are William Faulkner and Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, and Carson McCullers. Uh, we did The Heart is a Lonely Hunter um, back uh, last summer. And uh, that certainly has grotesque characters in it. Sound and the Fury has a idiot in the language of the novel who figures prominently in the novel has a brother who is suicidal, obsessed with Jesus Christ's sacrifice, has the sexual feelings towards his sister, and so on. Uh, the entire family is blighted with a kind of Southern Gothic um, dark fate. Uh, and you see that in uh, a number of Southern novels or works. Now, I want to make it clear, this is not my label. Um, I am not denigrating the South. Great works of literature. Absalom, Absalom is a good example of Southern Gothic. Um, Beloved, which wants you to believe that a dead girl has come back to life with the scar on her neck of having her throat slit. And she's exactly the age she would have been had she lived for the many years that she was absent in death. It's not a metaphor. It's not something you're supposed to think might happen. It's actually happening in the book. The mother of that dead child who cut her throat to save her from a fate worse than death she sought, being enslaved, um, is someone who keeps company with that dead girl who is her beloved. Um, you cannot appreciate that novel if you reduce it to poetry or metaphor. That's a supernatural visitation of the guilt, uh, the trauma, uh, the sin of what she's done, uh, possessing her daughter by treating her like property that she can discard, and then being possessed by her in the sense of having a poltergeist come. So there are writers, and certainly writers in the 21st and 20th century, who resist the label of Southern Gothic because they think that it's unfair or it's a label from the North, or it uh, compartmentalizes them in the same way that Larry McMurtry, a great novelist, didn't like that he was known as one of America's best regional novelists, like saying a lady doctor or a lady lawyer. Uh, he owned a bookstore in Texas, and he had T-shirts made that he wore that said, uh, one of America's finest regional novelists. And you can see why he would shape at that. But uh, the label is what uh, Flannery O'Connor took on herself to talk again. I'm going to use the phrase again, dark and divisive romance combined with comic grotesque tradition. And I think for most readers, as memorable as the religiosity of the book, and I think she means quite seriously that uh Hazel Motes is a believer, a Christian, in spite of himself. That's what she says, malgré lui, in spite of himself in the beginning. And he is so obsessive about the God he doesn't believe in that he believes in that God by absentia. That's serious in the book, but I don't think it's most of the book's power. And so I'll pause there for a moment now that Michael is back with us and see if there's anyone who wants to say anything about what I've said in this first, oh, wow, half hour. Okay, folks, so just a reminder, use the Q&A function and just pop a question or a comment in there, and uh, I'll have my eye on it. I'll relay it to, to Mark. So in the meantime, I'll just mention one thing that struck me when I when I went through the book again uh, just, just this weekend. Uh, the... I don't know about everything that you were saying in the first 15, 20 minutes, because I was in that board meeting. But, you know, the the animal related imagery on many of these characters is at the same time, it's it's a little bizarre and weird. It's also kind of funny 
you think about, I don't know what you would call the artistic style, but where you draw like a caricature of someone's face and, and, and turn them into like some type of an animal and, and, you know, give them a, you know, tweak their nose. And then before you know it, it looks like it's the snout of a pig or something. And it's funny. And it just seems like she does that a lot with most of the characters in the book, I think. But you, Mark? Yes. In fact, you may not know this, but uh, when she was in college, in addition to being an editor of prose, she was a cartoonist and quite a good one. Ah. Uh, she refers to Enoch Emery, uh, the 18-year-old uh, poor schmo who wishes that Hazel would give him the time of day, as having a fox-shaped face. Uh, he, we're told that he looks like a friendly hound dog with light mange. There's a, a, a compliment. Asa Hawks, whose last name Hawks is both an animal um, known for keen eyesight. He's supposed to be blind. And also the word we use for a salesman who's hawking his goods. We're told that he has uh, scars on his face that make him look like a grinning mandrel. Kluber Schultz's last name uh, is a kind of pig. And there are pigs actual pigs in the landscape uh, several times in the novel. And pigs has at least two biblical references that I'm aware of. When the apostles cast out demons uh, from men and presumably women, but maybe not, they put them into pigs that then threw themselves off a cliff. They, they were put into the body of a pig that is an unclean animal to be dispensed with. And of course, it's from the Bible that we get the phrase, don't cast your pearls before swine. Um, in the Odyssey, pigs are what men are turned into. And so that Hazel, that Schultz, Hoover Schultz has the name Schultz. So um, the, the caricature of people as animals or people as deformed is everywhere in the novel. And if we have time, I'll do a little catalog of that later. Any other comments or questions? Uh, here's uh, one. Uh, I thought the book was absurdist. I felt like I was reading Kafka. It seemed more than Southern Gothic, more universal. Yeah. So um, it's interesting. During her lifetime, a number of critics and readers commented on what they saw as a Kafkaesque uh, tone to the book. And uh, Flannery O'Connor, who is a very proficient and prompt letter writer, uh, because she was often housebound, one of the symptoms or consequences of lupus is your body gets very swollen and distended. I think it's one of the reasons why a lot of bodies in this novel, especially female bodies, are swole. She uses this southern idiom. Uh, people are fat, distended, distorted, swollen. Uh, <clears throat> she, uh, uh, she, she explained that she only read enough of Kafka to want to stop reading him. But she felt that reading the bits that she did of some of his novels made her a better writer. Now, people who know her biography better than I do suggest that she was, by nature, someone who was always underplaying her reading, her um, intelligence, her experience. So she might be kidding us or lying about that. But to that person who contributed that comment, um, yes, it's very Kafka-esque. I want to say that it can both be Southern Gothic and very universal. I don't think we have to say, rather than Southern Gothic, it's Kafka-esque. It's Southern Gothic that is also Kafka-esque. But there's no doubt that she uses a lot of the tropes, figures of speech, images, and a lot of the language of Southern Gothic. Um, the abuse of children, the neglect of children, um, children killed, suicide as a kind of matter of fact, um, easy sex, the 15-year-old Sabbath is looking uh, to be uh, seduced or seduce Hazel, partly because she feels that um, she's um, a sinner anyway because she's a bastard. Um, I think it's a mistake not to see it as a particularly Southern Gothic brand of uh, grotesquery. So I want to say that another context, because I see the time is flying. My, I do go on. Um, another aspect of 1950s American culture. So I want to look at the when this happened. 
I've already talked about the where, the Southern Gothicness, the Southern part of it, a little bit of the who, what we know about Flannery O'Connor. Now I want to talk about when. Um, the 1950s was a decade of commodity. Uh, television commercials, ads, buying things on the installment plan, the notion that the middle class was truly rising in America. As I said, baby boomers, the GI Bill, uh, a period of uh, middle class dominance. Uh, and so it shouldn't surprise us that the book is loaded with examples of commodity. Originally, commodity just meant something that made your life earlier, easier, a uh, commodity. And commodities could be things that you traded like grain or alfalfa. But it quickly got connected to commerce and commerce quickly got connected to advertising that now wasn't just in a local paper, but more broadly. And one of the ways it became more broad, there isn't a national TV network yet. There isn't a national radio network, but there are highways with billboards and billboards, Burma shave. Billboards become one of the ways people start to experience a nationalization of commodity. So let's think about this very religious book and recall some of the things that happened in the first few chapters. Um, in chapter one, um, he meets a porter who he's convinced is lying about who he really is. He's convinced that he's the son of a man from Hazel's own town. And that father's name is Cash. It's chapter one that he recalls going back to his old home that is in terrible disrepair. It's just a shell. Uh, and remembering that he put a sign on his chiffre robe saying, this property belongs to me. Anyone who tries to take it will be killed. Um, a strange thing, even for a man who doesn't believe in God or Jesus Christ. One of the first things he does when he gets to uh, the new town is he goes to a brothel that is a place of commerce. Um, in chapter three, it begins with a tension between transcendentalism and commercialism. Uh, so in my edition, which looks like this, uh, it's um, page 33, unnumbered 33. But if you have a book with you, it's the first page of chapter three. So he's been in town now, uh, talking to him uh, for second night. And he walked along downtown close to the storefronts, but not looking in them. The storefronts are there to be looked in. That's the whole point of having a storefront. The black sky was underpinned with long silver streaks that looked like scaffolding. And depth on depth behind it, with thousands of stars that all seemed to be moving very slowly as if they were about some vast construction work that involved the whole order of the universe and would take all time to complete. No one was paying any attention to the sky. Those few sentences are part of what makes this novel great. You don't have to agree with me, but that's my point this evening. Uh, he doesn't look at the storefronts, which are made to be looked into. He looks at the sky, which has scaffolding as if something vast is under construction that involves the whole order of the universe. Whether he likes it or not, he's a transcendentalist. And the scaffolding doesn't suggest that something's being destroyed. It's that something is under construction. In spite of himself, because he is the grandson of a preacher, because he is imbued with Southern culture, he thinks about the sky and transcendentalism and ignores the attraction of whatever's in the storefront. Later on in that paragraph near the bottom, at least the bottom in my edition, it says his neck was thrust forward as if he were trying to smell something that was always being drawn away. That's an extraordinarily apt and powerful image. He is restless and unfulfilled. It's not a hunger. It's not something he wants to hold. He has a whiff of something that's attractive. He leans forward to get more of it, and it's pulled away. 
Now, if you're reading this religiously, which all of us have the right to do, it's God pulling you in spite of your disbelief into belief, although we usually don't think of God tempting us with aroma. Uh, it's an appetite. He's already fed his sexual appetite, but it's not a commercial appetite. It's not buying something as he's going to buy a car in a subsequent chapter, uh, because, again, a man with a good car doesn't have to be redeemed. And how often have you gone into a car lot and asked the attendant for the best rat colored car they had? Uh, I don't think that comes up often. That's part of, again, her dark humor. It's a rat colored car with a two by, by four uh, in the back seat. Um, so he chooses, even if he's not doing it by choice, the transcendental scaffolding of a sky that seems under construction about something universal instead of the pull of commerce. But the pull of commerce is everywhere. The very next page where the preacher is later on going to talk, there's someone hawking potato peelers. Who buys potato peelers? Upwardly mobile, um, middle-class people. Because I don't need a potato peeler. I have a paring knife. But now there's a fancy, dancy, fancy dandy potato peeler as part of the culture of consumerism. And people are pulled between whether they're going to listen to the guy hawking potato peelers or what will eventually be the same place that Hayes stands on top of his rat-colored automobile and preaches. And the pile of potato peelers is referred to on page 34, the second page of the chapter, as an altar. It's in that same chapter that Enoch tells his tale of woe and says his father traded him to a welfare woman. That is, didn't give him away. It was an act of commerce, an act a transaction. In chapter four, he buys a rat colored car. In chapter five, there's the commodity of the shrunken man that Enoch shows him in the museum and the park, this thing that is an object that is valuable. It may have a transcendental significance, but like any other sacramental, holy water, rosary beads, a Bible that is not just a matter of what it says, but something to hold and believe in. Uh, uh, those first five chapters, the Shifero, the brothel, the potato peeler being traded, rat colored car, the shrunken man. Uh, he's more about commerce. The world is more about commerce than it is about religion. He rents a room in chapter six. He buys a new hat. Uh, that's the chapter in which he says nobody with a good car needs to be justified. And I, I, I'm very appreciative of the wit of this novel, wit of this novel. You could imagine that as a slogan for Chrysler. Uh, buy a new car and don't worry about being uh, justified. And that's just a sampling that one of the ways the novel is not just about religion. It is a satiric black comic criticism of commercial culture uh, on the rise in a new way in 1950s America. It's in response to that 1950s America that On the Road was published in 1957, one of the books we've talked about, or that Catcher in the Rye um, was published in 1951 for people who want to take it away from uh, that middle-class dominance, even though in the case of Holden, he's distinctly a middle-class kid sent to a prep school. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm returning uh, that we're coming up to the three quarters mark to the overall theme of this series, which is it's a mistake to think of the great American novel as a great American novel. I don't think this is what most people would consider a great American novel, capital G-A-N, but it is a powerful novel that partly defines itself in opposition to the white male, New England, um, uh, Eastern seaboard notion of who makes art, literary art, in the 20th century. And that's going to be the theme, not just last time, but next time and on and on and on. So I'll stop again, Michael. So one comment we had from before said, I, I found the book brilliant, beautifully written, and very funny, 
but I had trouble reading it because of the relentless cruelty in it. Yes, uh, I want to say I could not agree with that more. And I think it's a good uh, reflection of your humanity, the person who said that. Uh, it's painful to experience because we have to believe that those children were actually killed. We have to believe that not only did a policeman for no reason push his car into a cliff, down a cliff, but that they later on take a man who's clearly disabled and hit him over the head with a billy club and he winds up being dead. And then he's propped up in his landlady's uh, room and she's talking to him even though he's dead. And whether you care about Hazel as a character or not, if you believe that he was a human being, if you believe that Solace, the false preacher, the double uh, that he runs over, uh, was an actual human being, uh, if you think about the women especially that the novel um, uh, degrades by the way their bodies are talked about, it's impossible not to feel the pain. It's like any really black comedy. If some of you know, as some of you must, uh, the show um, uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry David of Seinfeld fame, uh, that's a comedy that is often so cringing it's impossible to laugh because of how awkward and painful and sometimes um, disregarding of human value. There was some of that in Seinfeld, uh, the serious joke that they were people who didn't have values. Uh, you may remember from, I think it's the 80s, <clears throat> the show, uh, the, the network show, L.A. Law. Uh, I think that was Stephen Bochco. But when that show was first produced, the goal of the writer and the producers, what now would be called the showrunners, was to make a drama where there were no regular characters who were normative or worthy of our admiration. They wanted to make a law firm where everybody was bad, morally bad. And if you watch, I'm not saying Jackson, you should, but if you watch the first few episodes, you see they try to do that. And it turned out that's not what people want to see on network TV in the 80s. And so all of a sudden, people who were difficult became difficult but charming, or they became curmudgeonly. They became nasty in a way that's like your Uncle Ned. Oh, he doesn't mean what he says. You get to know him, you can take him better. And it turned out they defanged the show because that kind of brutality, both by the characters and of the characters, People mistreat each other in this novel, and it's hard not to see the novelist as mistreating them. And no amount of saying, well, it's meant to be uh, satiric, changes the fact that it's upsetting to read. I can go see a movie and know that the knife that is being stuck into the body of an actor is not actually causing him to bleed. But it looks like he's bleeding, and there's a knife. And no amount of saying, oh, I realize this is a horror story and it's all make-believe can stop me from be feeling the very human empathetic response of, oh, my God, this person being stabbed. That's part of the dynamic of this book. Now, she wants us, in the broader sense, to feel that empathy. The patron who just said uh, that it's hard to read because it's upsetting Flannery O'Connor would say that's the empathy in you that is part of your spiritual grace, whether you know it or not, and whether you give it a name or a sect, that's part of what makes us human beings, that no amount of satire can wear us out from the human response of feeling bad for people. That's why Enoch uh, is in this novel. Enoch is a sweet boy who feels that he wants to share something important with an important person. He feels that he's on a mission. He has something awful to do. He has to steal this thing. Uh, it's abused later on by being thrown against the wall and just blown apart. He's lonely. He wants to connect. You know, we talked about sidekicks last time. He'd love to be uh, Hazel's sidekick. Let me say before I turn it over for more questions that the novel is loaded with metaphor and references to seeing, the blinding, a false blinding. Uh, the cover picks this up. We're told that Hazel looks at things 
even before he's blinded, but doesn't know what he's seeing. Uh, his name, Hayes, is clearly a joke about his being constantly in a haze. He honks a horn that makes no sound. He forms words with his lips and nothing comes out. Um, he he doesn't know exactly what he's doing. Um, Motes, M-O-T-E-S, would have the biblical reference um, to uh, the Matthew uh, verse uh, about first, before you think about casting out um, the lumber in the eyes of your brother, first take care of the moat uh, in your eye. That No, the lumber in your eye. Before you cast out the little particle, the moat, in another person's eye, look to the big piece of lumber in your own eye. So hazel moats, haze moats, is both a play on his being kind of in a fog, his not seeing well, even before he's blinded, um, and the idea of um, minding yourself before you become uh, a critique, criticism of someone else. I already mentioned that Asa Hawk's name, the last name, suggests both the keen-eyed bird, but also a hawker, someone selling, especially uh, outside of a store or on a street. And I myself hear an echo of Hayes in Asa Hawk's. So if you took the H of Hawks and put it in front of Asa, uh, you have something approximating Hayes. Um, so um, I'll just say very briefly, Mrs. Watts' body is seen in parts. She's wearing a nightgown. She's the prostitute with the brothel that is way too tight for her. She's described in very unattractive terms. Um, Enoch is voyeuring, voyeuristically watching women get out of the pool. This is in chapter 15, where the woman getting out of the pool is described by her individual parts, and she shakes the water off of her as if she were a dog. The welfare lady who trades for Enoch uh, that we hear about in chapter three, uh, we're told about her in his description. This woman was hard to get along with. She wasn't old. I reckon she was 40 year old. But she sure was ugly. She had this year brown glasses and her hair was so thin, it looked like ham gravy trickling over her skull. Whatever you make of that image, it's grotesque. Uh, it's not even the kind of metaphor or simile that compares her to a plant or an animal like a mandrel or a fox that we can see. Whoever in the history of civilization thought of a woman's hair looking like ham gravy trickling over her skull. Uh, again, that's part of that grotesquery. Um, the woman in the carnival who I mentioned uh, in a box lined uh, with a uh, cloth, uh, like a coffin, and I'll read one more. Um, well, why don't I ask you, uh, Michael, to tell us if we have anyone making comments, and I will try to find uh, the other thing I want to reference. Sure. Uh, okay, I got a couple of comments. One is that I think Okana parodies the modern idea of self-help, psychological, quote-unquote, religion of the feel-good self, as well as the commodification of society. I don't deny that. I think that I would agree with that. And the other person's comment was from earlier on in immediate reaction earlier, the Gothic and romantic combination definitely flourished in the Phantom of the Opera, which just closed on Broadway, revealing that this tradition is quite alive. Yes, I think these things are part of human nature. Uh, they come into being at certain times not because human nature fundamentally changes, but the culture in which human nature is revealed changes. So we can see new aspects of human nature because there's an internet or streaming services or online video games or chat rooms or internet dating that reveal things that couldn't have been revealed before because that cultural context uh, was not there. Um, 
I had another good quote I wanted to read to you, but I seem not to be able to find it. So um, we're coming up to the top of the hour. I'm going to see if I can't locate it. Um, Michael, do, do, does anyone else have something to add before? I, nope, I those, were the, those were the last two. I would only throw in there when you were talking about uh, some of the tragic misfortune that occurs to some of the characters, but yet uh, can be viewed in some ways, I guess, as comedic. Is that I, th- I forget who said it. I was I think it was a pretty famous comedian, but he was talking about comedy, and he I think he said something like, you know. Comedy is always about seeing somebody else's misfortune, which is why you laugh when the guy slips on a banana peel. Yeah, and 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 that same vein is that you see someone walk into an open manhole and fall, and it's funny, but not if the camera goes and looks down the manhole and you see somebody bleeding and unconscious, uh, then that's not funny. Right. Um, so. Uh, it's odd that when he sees um, the the brothel owner for the first time, um, she's not attractive. We're told that her grin is as curved and sharp as the blade of a sickle. If you want to know what prose is about, pay attention to the images and the similes. Mrs. Watts' grin is as curved and sharp as the blade of a sickle. In Joyce's story, The Boarding House uh, has reference to this. I mean, has a connection to this in terms of comparison. Uh, Mrs. Mooney, who's the owner of The Boarding House, um, goes through problems like a cleaver. Uh, She just puts that chopping down and has her way. This uh, boarding house, boarding house owner, has a grin as curved and sharp as a blade. It was plain that she was so well adjusted that she didn't have to think anymore. Her eyes took everything in whole like quicksand. Again, if you want reasons to like that no- this novel, that's one of them. The storefront versus the sky is one. Enoch on his belly hiding in the bushes to look at the women getting out of the pool when he's on a break from working at the zoo and it's impossible not to see the connection between working at a zoo where animals are on display and treating these women who again are almost always overweight and grotesque in different ways in the way they're described by the narrator not to see that connection um that a woman takes everything in like quicksand is such a brilliant image not of understanding not of articulation or uh, uh, integration, but annihilation. Who would ever say about someone we admired, or even if we wanted to be neutral, oh, she doesn't miss anything. She takes everything in like like quicksand. Say that at your next party and see how it goes over. So I, I hope that's helpful, especially to those of you, I only heard from one, but for those of you who read the novel, uh, and understood how disturbing um, Hazel Motes is and how disturbing the novel is, but maybe look for a better understanding of ways to engage it. And I, I gave this tonight as an example of a novel that may not be hard to read in the sense that it's not dense, it's not elusive, you don't need to know a lot about references. It's unpleasant to read, although if you have a bent towards black comedy, uh, you may enjoy it more. But it's hard to make a kind of broader sense of, and I think impossible if you limit yourself to Catholic thought or even Protestant religion. But if you bring in the notion of 1950s commercialism, if you bring in the notion of this parody of women's bodies, when one of the things she's talking about is that Southern women, Southern bells, were known in the day for curating their own bodies, for being so attentive to not having a hair out of place. And the first woman we meet uh, in the brothel is a woman whose professional job is to have men sleep with her, and she's terrible. Another woman has green on her teeth, and another woman has marks on her face that make it look like toadstools are growing out of her face. Well, toadstools, 
toadstools, mushrooms, grow where something's rotting. They grow where there's something decaying underneath. Horrific images almost always of women. Now, some of that may be that her own body betrayed her, uh, that she herself was infirm uh, for the last uh, years of her life, real mobility issues. One of, as I said, the symptoms, the immobilizing symptoms of lupus uh, or of the steroids taken to treat it is that you swell up. And there are lots of references. Uh, the baby that lives with the grandmother and the grandmother swells up to the point where you may remember she hangs herself because she can't take it anymore. Um, these are all meant to be satires on aspects of Southern culture, the commerce, uh, the veneration of a human body that is a misplacement of where we should put our values. That's all quite serious, not just the belief in Jesus Christ. I hope that's helpful. I think that's great. Thanks, Mark. It's really, uh, really uh, illuminating. And like I said, folks, we're skipping next week, so we'll see everybody in two weeks. I don't know, Mark, do you want to just say like a sentence about the next book? Yes, I want to say that Woman Warrior by Maxine Hong Kingston, published in 1976, has a remarkable opening story called No Name Woman. Uh, I admire Woman Warrior, but there's nothing in it as good as the first story, which doesn't mean read the first story and stop there. But I will say that if you read the whole book, I encourage you before we meet to reread the first story. No Name Woman is a remarkable work of short fiction. No Name Woman. And that's how, what I'll say about that. Fantastic. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for coming. And I hope you uh, got a lot out of this as I did. And uh, like I said, we'll see you in two weeks. And thanks, Mark. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. I hope you stay well. Good night, everybody.